Well, let's just hear then God's word. This is the psalmist speaking, Psalm 71. And he says, For you are my hope, O Lord God. You are my trust from my youth. By you I have been upheld from birth. You are he who took me out of my mother's womb. My praise shall continually be of you. I have come as a wonder, become as a wonder to many, but you are my strong refuge. Let my mouth be filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Or oh, let our mouths be filled with praise as we sing um, this first hymn, 130, 130. My hope is fixed on God alone, the God of sovereign grace whose heart conceived a glorious plan of mercy for rebellious man, for Adam's fallen race. 130. testimony of the psalmist whose words we read 
uh, and throughout the whole of the scriptures and indeed throughout all the centuries since, uh, countless multitudes have testified that those who fix their hope on Almighty God are never, ever disappointed because you are a God who cannot fail. You are a God who sets in place your plans and purposes and there is no power in heaven, on earth or hell beneath that can thwart them. And you have uh, fixed uh, a glorious plan of redemption for fallen sinners. And those who have trusted you, those who've looked to you for mercy, those who have pinned all their expectations upon you, I would never have cause to, re to resent that they did such a thing because you are the God who is always faithful. And that too is our testimony uh, that your hand has been upon us indeed from the moment we first drew breath. And if we have come to know you as our God and as our Father, then you have guided our footsteps, you've watched over us, you've kept us safe, you've provided all our needs, and you have, through the ministry of your Holy Spirit, directed us to the Saviour, the one who died upon the cross for sinners. And there all our expectations uh, have been wonderfully realised and we've never felt let down. We've never felt abandoned or discarded. We've always known what it is to be guided and directed by a God who is full of grace and full of kindness and full of love and a saviour who remains our constant companion throughout all life's difficulties and who has promised that one day he will come again and then he'll take us to be with him where he is, the place he has gone to prepare for us. So in a largely hopeless world where men are clinging on the most futile expectations that can never be realised, uh, we who know you as our God, and we who are privileged to be part of your family, brothers and sisters, in the Lord Jesus, we have always found that there is trustworthiness and certainty uh, uh, and loyalty to your people that has been the mark of your dealings with us. So we can sing with joy and with thanksgiving tonight that that is where our hope is fixed and we do not expect that we will have cause to feel grief over that, whatever happens to us uh, throughout the rest of this earthly pilgrimage, because you will bring us at last to glory. So accept our gratitude and our thanks and our praise and our worship this evening as we offer it in the name of the Lord Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Now we're reading from the prophet Ezekiel tonight, our scripture reading, Ezekiel and chapter 33. And we're going to begin the reading at verse 21, so that's on page 763. Ezekiel chapter 33 and at verse 21. Ezekiel then 33, verse 21. It came to pass in the twelfth year of our captivity, in the tenth month, on the fifth day of the month, that one who had escaped from Jerusalem came to me and said, The city has been captured. Now the hand of the Lord had been upon me the evening before the man came who had escaped, and he had opened my mouth so that when he came to me in the morning, my mouth was opened and I was no longer mute. And then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, 
They who inhabit those ruins in the land of Israel are saying, Abraham was only one, and he inherited the land, but we are many. The land has been given to us as a possession. Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord God, You eat meat with blood, you lift up your eyes toward your idols and shed blood. Should you then possess the land? You rely on your sword, you commit abominations, and you defile one another's wives. Should you then possess the land? Say thus to them, Thus says the Lord God, As I live, surely those who are in the ruins shall fall by the sword, and the one who is in the open field I will give to the beast to be devoured, and those who are in the strongholds and caves shall die of the pestilence. I will make the land most desolate. Her arrogant strength shall cease, and the mountains of Israel shall be so desolate that no one will pass through. Then they shall know that I am the Lord, when I have made the land most desolate because of all their abominations which they have committed. As for you, son of man, uh, the children of your people are talking about you beside the walls and in the doors of the houses, and they speak to one another, everyone saying to his brother, Please come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. So they come to you as people do. They sit before you as my people, and they hear your words, but they do not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument, for they hear your words, but they do not do them. And when this comes to pass, as it surely will come, then they will know that a prophet has been among them. May God the Holy Spirit then give us understanding of his holy and precious word this evening. We sing 493, 493, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. 493. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only Son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of sinning loss, the Father turns his face away as wounds which are the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sins upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I 
with will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Continue then in prayer. Almighty God, gracious, loving, heavenly Father, we come once more into your presence. We come pleading the name and the merit of the Lord Jesus because we have no other grounds upon which we as sinful men and women can expect to stand in a, a presence of a holy God who is of purer eyes than to look upon iniquity. We claim only the righteousness that has been conferred to us as a free gift from the sacrifice of our Saviour upon the cross, and that to us has been the supreme measure of the height and the depth and the breadth and the greatness of your love to us, such undeserving men and women as we are. Uh, and, and we thank you that we know we are loved. We thank you that we have been given that capacity ourselves within us as being human, that uh, we love one another, we love uh, those who are very dear to us. Uh, we thank you for that ability to know that emotion which is so very special and so very real to us. And we grieve for those who pass through their lives in this world in a, a lovelessness state. And sadly, it is the case for many. But we know the love of one another which is precious to us but we have come to know you and we have come to know about an everlasting love. We have come to know a love which was willing to pay the price of the gift of your own dear son, sparing him nothing so that we might know that you have loved us at such a price, at such a cost, borne by the Lord Jesus for us. Because having loved his people, he loved them to the end. So we rejoice in that and we thank you for it and we thank you for the comfort and the reassurance it gives us. We remember tonight those who are not with us, uh, some are on a time of holiday. We thank you for these opportunities that come to us in the course of busy lives, just to be able to relax for a time and recharge our batteries, as it were. Uh, and so we will ask, O oh God, that where they are, you will watch over them and bring them safely back to us in due course. Once again, we pray for our pastor and his colleagues there in that vast cosmopolitan city that is our capital, uh, and for that um, God-given task you have laid upon their hearts to make the gospel known in that needy place. And we pray, O oh Lord, that there may be much joy in heaven over repenting sinners as a consequence of that activity and that many will come to know the Saviour for themselves. We commend them then to your grace here tonight and pray that you will watch over them during these coming days. We pray too for all such activity that is taking place. We, we thank you. There are opportunities during a holiday period 
that as people stroll, as it were, uh, and relax, then sometimes they are more open to stop and listen to something which is being proclaimed. We thank you for the beach missions. We thank you for that work amongst the young people which has been used so greatly of you over the years. Uh, and that is, uh, is, is also reaching the, the ears and the hearts of the parents of these young people. And we ask that there might be a much spiritual blessing result from that labor. And we thank you for all similar such activities for Christian camps. Uh, again, young people exposed to the gospel, set up free as it were from that which occupies them during the rest of the year, ready to hear good news about a Savior who loves them and gave himself for them. We pray for Christian house parties uh, and ask your blessing upon them too. And so we pray for that as we pray also for the ongoing work of the gospel in our land. We pray for those who are gathered like we are in the villages, in the towns, in the big cities. Some very small in number, some much larger but the word of God is being opened. There is still liberty for us to do that. Uh, there is freedom to worship, and we bless you for that. Uh, and we pray, Lord, that even tonight, even tonight, there be much spiritual fruit result from your word being proclaimed and the glorious gospel, the good news of salvation in the Lord Jesus is being heralded up and down our land, and also across the world. Remember again our brothers and sisters who are in places of great peril. We think again of the Ukraine, we think again of Gaza. Uh, sometimes we find it difficult to know exactly what to pray for about these situations, but we can pray that uh, your will might be done. And in the midst of the carnage and the bloodshed and the grief and the suffering, some might be constrained to look to you for mercy and find it because you're a God who delights in mercy. We pray for Pastor Daniel uh, uh, and the uh, members of the church in Philam uh, and the children they are caring for who, uh, as far as we know, are making a home in the forest to be safe from the conflict that's taking place in their streets. We ask that you'll provide for their needs and you'll watch over them and keep them safe. Likewise, we pray for down there in Calais and the valley where at the moment there's comparative stability, but nevertheless where uh, maybe sometime in the next few days a war will break out there in that town uh, and, O oh Lord, we just commend them to your grace and to your mercy in these perilous days. We pray for all your people in difficult situations, persecuted, um, uh, isolated, maybe starving and deprived of this world's necessities, or, or facing uh, maybe a devastation of, of the climate, whatever it may be. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will look upon them with kindness as we commend them to your grace. And now, Lord, we pray for ourselves. You've drawn us together. We cannot believe that it is without purpose. We know you always act with purpose. And it's been your intention that we should find ourselves here tonight in this place with an open Bible uh, and uh, with ears that can hear, grant that those ears might be opened, but grant above all that hearts might be opened and there might be a ready response to the word of God that comes to us here in this place this evening. So our God, we ask for your continuing presence with us throughout the course of this service. May it bring glory to your name, and much blessing to our hearts. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. 
Now let's sing together 505, the hymn 505. The love of Christ who died for me is more than mine can know. His mercy measureless and free to meet the debt I owe. 505. Some people like to live dangerously, don't they? Uh, there's a whole branch of sport which is categorized as a dangerous sport. It's beyond my comprehension that anybody should take delight from clinging to a sheer vertical rock face, holding on only by their fingertips uh, and toenails, and take pleasure in it. Or to jump in an aeroplane. Uh, and go up maybe three, four thousand feet and then jump out of the aeroplane with nothing on their backs but a bit of cloth. Um, uh, that's something way beyond my comprehension. But people like it and they get a buzz from it. They get a, an adrenaline um, junky feeling, apparently, so they say. Uh, and so they like to live dangerously. But life is dangerous, can be extremely dangerous, and sometimes it's not quite as obvious as that. There are hidden dangers, aren't there? Uh, I mean, sometimes in a very crowded city centre, and there are people all around me making their way down the street, uh, and maybe a good 50% of them have got a phone in front of them there, uh, and they appear to be entirely oblivious to what is going on around them, and if there was some obstacle in their way, or the perhaps foolish they could step into the road, <coughs> then bang, um, they would be in some real difficulty. They are, there are hidden dangers, aren't there? Uh, uh, and we have to be cautious, of course, be sensible. Uh, and there is an even greater danger. 
and that is to follow a way of life or thought or practice and in doing so persuading yourself that it has made you safe. It is quite possible to live like that. Many people are doing that. I think there are many people in places like this, up and down the land, Christian churches, who have convinced themselves that their very presence in a place like this, doing the things they're doing, engaging in religious exercise, has made them safe. Uh, and, and, and the sad truth is, that is a very risky mindset if that's where their confidence is reposed. And so here is a message that concerns us because that is what we are in, a place of worship. It's not relevant to the vast majority of people out there but it is to us uh, and we might very well be in danger and not realise it and even worse than not realising it, persuading ourselves that actually we are safe. Safe from a God who is angry with sinners every day and who has promised judgment to those who persist in, in such a course of action. There is an example here in the scripture that we read from the prophet Ezekiel, not the easiest book of the Bible to comprehend in many ways. I've never dared really to embark upon it in any depth. But there is an example here. Uh, in the year 597 BC, a young priest, about 25 years old, was transported 700 miles east from his home city of Jerusalem to the great city of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar's policy to maintain control over his colonies, if you like, was to transport vast numbers of young men over to Babylon and there to seek to immerse them so much in Babylonian culture and religion and so on that he could send them back and by that means they would influence uh, activities and, and affairs back uh, in their home city and maintain his control. You, you get a much clearer um, expression of that policy in the book of Daniel. You might know that, that there's Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, uh, and they're fed the, the Babylonian food, they're exposed to Babylonian culture, and so on and so forth, and the idea it was to Babylonize them, if you like, so that they could then uh, have an influence if they were sent back home. It didn't work. It didn't work. It didn't work with Daniel and his colleagues. And here, in this story um, uh, that is recorded for us in Ezekiel, there is also the same policy which is afoot, that here are young men who have been uh, captured from their home cities and transported to Babylon with the idea that they will become Babylonized. Uh, uh, and uh, we, just, we can pick up hints here and there uh, in, the, in the record that it didn't work. There's a very sad psalm, Psalm 137, by the waters of Babylon we sat and wept, it says. It plainly was their custom to gather together as Jews uh, and they were very conscious of retaining their identity to resist the pressures that are put on them by the Babylonian authorities and retain their culture and their identity and they would gather by the rivers of Babylon and passers-by would say, come and sing us one of your songs. And they said, no, we're too sad to be able to do that because we're missing Zion, we're missing Jerusalem, we're missing our homeland. Uh, 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 and that would be the situation here uh, that Ezekiel records. Uh, young men like this, gathering together in their little communities. It's been actually interesting, isn't it? Historically speaking, 
that the Jewish people, wherever they've been dispersed, have all sought to retain their Jewish identity. Uh, and that's just the policy here. And so here are these young men, largely young men, and Ezekiel is one of them. He has been subjected to the same treatment, but he's been sent by God to minister to them. And so here they are gathered together, uh, and the situation has been desperate enough because they've been carted away from their homeland, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and they wonder about what is going on back at home, and then news comes. Jerusalem has fallen. It came to pass in the twelfth year of our captivity, in the tenth month, on the fifth day. Specific dates are given to us here. This is an historical event. That one who had escaped from Jerusalem came to me and said the city has been captured. That's about the most depressing and de devastating news that these uh, people could have ever hoped they would never hear. The city has been, it's fallen. The society is utterly broken. It's again very relevant to our current society. Society is utterly broken and God has visited his judgment and the Babylonian forces have captured the city. The news is as bad as it is possibly could get. And here they are and they're devastated. And they're looking for some comfort, some sort of relief, some way of coping with, with this terrible news. And so they say to themselves, we know what we'll do. We'll go along and we'll listen to Ezekiel. Uh, that will make us feel a bit better. It maybe lift our spirits a bit because he's got a gift. He's, he's got a real gift of eloquence. Uh, uh, and maybe he will speak to us words of comfort. Uh, uh, and it will make us at least, for the time being, feel a bit better. So their reaction, if you like, to bad news was to do, I suppose to put it in, into modern terms, to go to church, like we've done tonight. Go to church and listen to the preacher. Maybe he's got something comforting to say to us. And Ezekiel is an eloquent young man, gifted by God, a prophet of God. Uh, uh, and he brings God's word to him. So they say, let's go along and see what Ezekiel has got to say. And perhaps it will make us feel better. Uh, he's a good speaker. Um, he, he's, he's a familiar figure amongst us. He's been here for a while. Uh, and he's got a lovely message. And it comes over to us in our distress and our concern. comes over to us something like a love song make us feel a bit better. And there in verse 32 of this 33rd chapter, uh, uh, God says to Ezekiel, look, you are to them as a very lovely song uh, of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. So uh, if we translate to... Uh, our modern situation, our relevant situation, here tonight, in this place, then here is the gospel presented to us. That's my task. I have a responsibility. Ezekiel had a responsibility. Uh, if you read the rest of the chapter, the earlier part of the chapter, you'll see that a watchman who fails to warn the people of danger, he will be held responsible for that. And I'm held responsible tonight to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you that the gospel is like a love song. I've chosen the hymns very deliberately to that effect. The love of God in Christ Jesus in the gospel. And it's a lovely message. And so they went along to hear Ezekiel, to hear this lovely message in the hope that it will make them feel a bit better and lift their spirits. So they listen to it, and it's like a love song. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a melody. Uh, uh, and that is actually a very appropriate way to describe what the gospel is. It is a song 
of love. Amazing love. Amazing grace. I mean, I, I could point to countless portions of the word of God that depict the gospel just in that way. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with the cords of love, God says. God commends his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is love. Not that we love God, but he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. A love song. And here's the very best love song of all, and you know it so, so well. God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It is a very apt description of the message of the gospel that we preachers are commissioned to declare. And it is a song of amazing love in the gospel. But there is an undertone to it. Uh, 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 and, and, uh, and the danger is to miss the undertone and the challenge. And sadly, that is exactly the situation here. So they come to you, as people do, because they've said to one another, please come and hear what the word is that comes to the Lord. Ezekiel will know, he's a prophet. He'll be able to tell us what God has got in mind. So they come to you, as people do, they sit before you as my people and they hear your words, but they do not do them. They hear your words, but they do not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song. A pleasant instrument. They hear your verse, words, but they do not do them. Uh, uh, and so we, 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 we are uh, confronted with what is the most beautiful, loveliest love song the world has ever possibly known, but it tells us at the same time the great danger is to hear the song, to even respond to it. Because it's heartwarming, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, in a loveless world, in a world that is beset by awful examples of the hatred of man to his fellow man, to hear something about love, it's no wonder is it, that um, love songs, I'm talking about um, secular love songs, are very appealing, very much a part of, of the musician's repertoire, and people go along in their thousands to listen to those who are rendering this love song. And, a, and it appeals to them, and they respond to it. It touches uh, some part of us as human beings, doesn't it? Because God is a very gracious God. And he's, he's given us a capacity sometimes to be able to just put on one side some of the uh, awful and appalling things that surround us in our world and we find sadly within our own hearts and, 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 and just respond to a song of love. And, and that's why uh, the gospel, uh, and that's why we're thankful for a hymn book, because the gospel is set uh, in musical terms. And so we can sing about the gospel as well as listen to it. Uh, and it's all very comforting, and it's all very pleasant, and it's a nice way to spend a Sunday evening, but the tragedy might be, as was the case here in Ezekiel's day, 
that you hear the love song and you may even respond to it at some level but you don't do anything about it. And that is the danger that I've been talking about. That is leveling so dangerously. Because we do respond to it. Uh, and the gospel is certainly music to the ears. But to hear and to respond and to fail to act upon it, that is the most perilous pathway that you might possibly choose. That is the challenge of it, isn't it? And Ezekiel records it here. Uh, and the Lord Jesus himself um, speaks of it. Uh, there's a very well-known little parable. The Lord Jesus spoke during his earthly ministry about two builders. Uh, and they're seeking to uh, erect for themselves a, a, a residence. Uh, and, and one, they're looking for a plot of ground on which to do it. Uh, and so uh, here's one man, and he's found a piece of ground. It is uh, hard going because it's very rocky, and it's going to require a lot of sweat and toil in order to, to put in place the foundations that his house is going to need. But he sets his mind to it. And here's another man, and he's found his plot of land. But it's soft soil, it's sandy soil. And so he can dig into it with a not a lot of effort, and he can put something in place and erect his residence on it. But Jesus says when the storm comes, when the waters rise, when the flood comes, well, the house on the rock stands firm, it can withstand the howling gale. It can withstand the flood waters that rise, but the house on the sand collapses. And Jesus said, this is exactly the case, exactly the case of those who hear my words, both hear, hear my words, and do not do them the edifice they've constructed, the place that they've put in, 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 in place uh, is, is, is uh, and supposed to be their place of safety and refuge is no refuge whatsoever because it's built on the wrong foundations. So there's a New Testament example of the Old Testament example that we find here with these people in Babylon. They hear the gospel, they hear it as a love song, it's very appealing, uh, uh, and for a moment, yeah, they do feel a bit better, they feel comforted, but they don't do it, and then disaster is about to fall on them. When this comes to pass, they will know, God said, they will know when the disaster falls, they will know that they had a prophet, they heard the message, but they didn't do anything about it. And that is the great danger. That, that is a, a danger which is much more subtle than clambering up a rock face or jumping out of a, a, an aeroplane with a parachute or the many other dangerous activities that some people like to engage in far more dangerous because that, that's an obvious danger so you take precautions don't you so you're climbing up the rock face but you make sure you've got the right tools to do it you make sure you've got a rope around you that if you fall off the rock face, you're going to be safe, or you go into your airplane, you make sure your parachute is properly packed. You take precautions. When you know the danger, you take precautions. But it's the hidden danger, and it's the danger that where you actually can persuade yourself you're safe. That is the really perilous one. And that's exactly the case for those who hear the gospel, but do not
put it into practice. Do not respond to it. The love song, the love song of the gospel, uh, I've taken great pains to make sure rings out again in this place tonight. That's the hymns I've chosen reflect that. Uh, And the passage of scripture that I'm bringing to you reflects that. And it speaks specifically of the gospel in those terms. Something very lovely. And the love song rings out again. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. But the challenge now is, seeing the balls in your court, I've done my job. The ball is in your court and it demands action. The love song, God so loved the world, demands action. Whosoever believes will not perish. Yes, so you hear it. Oh, it's a lovely... I can remember that text from my Sunday school days, you will say to yourself. And it's one of the few Bible texts, I suppose, that might be at least to some extent familiar to most people. But, you know, the, the, the catch in it, if you like, is it says you have to believe, and if you believe, you won't perish. And if you don't believe, you will perish. And there's where a real tragedy can unfold. And it's often the case, isn't it, with a love song, that, 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 that love and pathos go together. <laughs> Um, there, there, there is very often in a love song a note of sadness, isn't there? Uh, I, I'm thinking of some of the, you know, the really well-known songs that you know have been part of our heritage, and, and many of them will contain that element, won't they, of loss and sadness and death, and I, I, I suppose that adds to their appeal, doesn't it? Really. This is real life, isn't it? (laughs) Life is like that. Love and loss very often go together. Uh, And that's exactly the case with the gospel message. Love and loss can go together. So you can love the sound of the gospel. But you can lose your soul. If you don't respond, you can have the lovely words in your mind. They can issue from your lips. They may even touch your heartstrings. And you can still be lost. Still be lost. But for those who believe and trust, who hear the gospel, respond to the love that is so much an essential part of the gospel, and then put their trust in the one of whom it speaks. Then to them, his name, his name is music in your ears. Uh, and, And it's music in your heart. And you'll be thrilled to know it's music that you will hear in heaven because they sing in heaven. And the song they sing is a song of love. So that is the danger I'm warning you about. But that is the assurance I can give you. Hear the gospel, believe in the Lord Jesus, and that is ultimate security and safety. The word of God challenges us, doesn't it, at all levels. (laughs) Even when it seems to be um, shrouded in nice, warm, almost sentimental terms. It challenges us, doesn't it? 
God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's down to you to respond to that. Amen. I, lo I love this last hymn. I'd have it every Sunday if I'm dead. <laughs> My song is love unknown. 252, 252. My song is love unknown. My Saviour's love to me, love to the loveless shown that they might lovely be. Or who am I that for my sake my Lord should take frail flesh and die? 252. loved us and sent his son for the propitiation for our sins or that we might know that love in all its richness and abundance as we move on into the coming week and the coming years and may go with us tonight as we make our way homes may 
the mercy of Almighty God be our song tonight and forevermore. Amen.